Good morning, happy Sabbath, everyone. You guys can start making your way to your seats and we're gonna need a squish because we have several guests coming today, over a hundred other, other, other people. So make sure you guys take all the space available. Um, I just wanted to pray before we get into our Sabbath school time and uh, so let's bow our heads. Dear Heavenly Gracious Father God, Lord, we want to thank you for another Sabbath, Lord, another day where we can come together and worship you, Lord. We thank you for this weekend that we have a, a special speaker, Lord, to touch our hearts, God. I ask that you be with our ears, help them to be open so we can listen to the message you have for us, and be with um, Pastor Ivor as he shares that message from you, God. Lord, thank you again for your love and your mercies, and just a time that we can spend together worshiping you. In your most holy name, amen. All right, uh, good morning, everyone, and happy Sabbath. Um, so uh, this morning, I am going to be presenting to you, um, I was actually looking at some of your questions last night, and one theme that I saw over and over was how do you um, come closer to God? How do you get on fire and keep that fire? Um, and so today I want to, this morning I want to just address that through this uh, Sabbath school. Um, and we're going to, we're going to get into the word of God. I'm going to show you some things that hopefully will get you excited about the Bible. How many of you would like to be excited about the Bible? Okay. Um, so let's pray. Uh, and then we're going to jump right in. Um, and do you all have that image ready? Okay. I I'll tell you when. I'll tell you when. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, um, give us uh, your spirit today, Lord. Please speak um, to us this morning, Lord. And may our hearts be set on fire is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, so um, I was probably about 17 years old at the time. It's a seemingly insignificant um, thing I'm about to share with you, but looking back, uh, you're going to catch the, the, the significance of this um, after I share. So I was in the mall uh, walking with a bunch of my friends, just, you know, hanging out in the mall. And um, as we were walking around, I remember there was a group of people standing around looking at something and and they looked to be like totally amazed and i'm they actually caught my attention because they were just so like excited about what they were seeing and so i kind of walked over to where they were and they were looking at something like this And the same look of confusion that is on your faces right now, that's what was on my face. I looked at the picture, and then I looked back at them, and I looked back at the picture, and they were like, yo, oh, man. And I'm looking at them like, what is the matter with y'all? And then, you know, I got close enough to where I was kind of trying to figure out why they were so excited. And someone said to me, yo, you got to do this thing with your eyes. And if you do this thing with your eyes, then that image that just looks like a bunch of zigzag lines is going to become a 3D picture. And I was like, come on. So then I started trying to do this thing with my eyes. I was crossing my eyes. I was doing everything I possibly could. And then something happened where I did that thing with my eyes. And when I did that thing with my eyes, I was like, oh, yo, look at that. How many of you see the dolphin in the picture? 
You see the dolphin? Who see, you see the dolphin? Anybody else see the dolphin? <laughs> what do you do with your eyes? <laughs> If, if, you, if you stare at the picture, don't focus on the picture. Kind of like let your eyes relax and, and almost cross your eyes. Like bring the picture together and then bring it back out again with your eyes. How many of you see the dolphin? All right. I know what y'all are thinking right now. Man, there ain't no dolphin there. The dolphin is there. The dolphin is there. All right. So listen, y'all. Um, the purpose of the Sabbath school today is not to try to, to find the dolphin in the picture. How many of you feel like you could stay here all day trying to look, look for the dolphin? <laughs> How many of you would like to spend significant time trying to find the dolphin? How many of you are frustrated that you cannot see the dolphin? All right. Y'all keep your hands up. You're frustrated that you cannot see the dolphin. Raise your hands nice and high. Okay. How many of you, if you cannot see the dolphin, feel like I'm not wasting any more time looking for this dolphin? Okay. Very good. Very good. You can just leave the picture up there. That's the only picture we're going to use this morning. Um, how many of us, when we read the Bible, all we see are zigzag lines? Raise your hand. Come on, y'all. Raise your hand. When you read the Bible, you wish you could see. You wish, like, man, a lot of this just doesn't make sense to me. I feel like I'm looking at... Zigzag lines. Now, last night y'all heard me speak and y'all were like, man, how are you so excited about the Bible? It's because I did that thing with my eyes. And so when I'm reading the Bible, I'm like, oh, yo, check this out. How many of you would like to have the, oh, yo, check this out experience when you read the Bible. Because if you had that experience, you're more likely to, to call your friends and be like, yo, yo, look. Like, now, how many of you, if you see the dolphin, now you're like, yo, I want to show this to my friends. I want y'all to find the dolphin. And you, you're going to have a little joy as they're frustrated. And you're like, no, this is what you need to do. What if I told you you could have that experience with the Bible? Where when you see the Bible, when you read the scripture, that thing happens with your eyes where you're like, I can't wait to show somebody this. Y'all are still busy looking for the dolphin. <laughs> that's, what I that's what I want y'all to do with the Bible. Right? That's what I want y'all to do with the Bible. So... Um, let me tell you a story. This is uh, actually found in the book of Luke. Um, Y'all remember the story where Jesus, you know, he's just been crucified. And then there are those two disciples that are walking on the road to Emmaus. Remember that story? And as they're walking, uh, Jesus draws near. Y'all remember that story? And the Bible says that they did not recognize him. Their eyes were beholden so that they could not see him. Maybe when they saw him, they, they just saw a bunch of zigzag lines. They didn't know it was Jesus. So they're sad. Why are they sad? Because Jesus, they've seen him crucified. And the Bible says that Jesus draws near, and he's like, why are you all so sad? And then they say, have you not heard the things that have happened in the last few days? And then Jesus says, what things? And they begin to tell him all the reasons why they are sad. How many of you um, have experienced reasons to be sad? Man. And so Jesus, what does he do? 
Do you think he cares about the disciples' happiness? Do you think he wants them to be sad? Why are they sad? Because they think Jesus is what? Is dead. So, listen, if, some, if your family thought you were dead and you weren't and they were sad and you wanted them to not be sad, what would you do? Hey, I'm not dead. Does Jesus do that? He doesn't do that. Instead, the Bible says, and beginning from Moses and the prophets, Jesus began to expound in the scriptures all the things concerning himself. He gives them a Bible study. Now, I don't know about you, but I can imagine if you just lost someone, you're probably not in the mood for a Bible study. And yet this is what Jesus does. The Bible says, beginning from Moses and the prophets, he expounded unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning who? Himself. So that means Jesus takes them back into the Old Testament and he begins to break down scripture in a way where he is showing them himself in the scriptures. And the Bible says that as they're walking and talking, they come to this place where Jesus is about to part ways with them. And then they're like, no, don't go. We want more Bible study. Now, I need y'all to catch the significance of that. They are weeping. They are sad because the one that they believe was the Messiah is dead. And here comes this guy giving them a Bible study. And they get so excited about the Bible study that they're like, don't go yet. The Bible says Jesus then breaks bread with them and that their eyes were what? opened, and they knew that it was Jesus. And then they said these words, did not our hearts burn within us as he opened the scriptures by the way? They were literally saying, yo, that Bible study just set our hearts on fire. How many of you would like to experience heartburn? How many of you would like to have your heart set on fire? Can you imagine what kind of Bible study that must have been? And what did Jesus do in the study? He pointed to himself in all the scriptures. Meaning Jesus is here saying the focus of your Bible study ought to be Jesus. Every time you open the Bible, you should be looking for Jesus. Well, what does that mean? Where would we find Jesus in the Bible? Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, right? Except wrong. Because, yes, he's there. But he's also in the book of Genesis. In the very beginning. When God said, let there be light, is Jesus the light of the world? On day two, when God brings the waters into, when he separates the waters, is Jesus the water of life? Do y'all know what happened on the third day of creation? The first fruits came out of the ground. On the third day, the first fruits came out of the ground. I'm just going to keep saying that. On the third day, on the third day, the first, you just saw something. Somebody just saw something that made her go, oh, now the rest of you are still like zigzag lines. On the third day, the first fruits came up out of the ground. On the fourth day, Jesus is the son of righteousness. On the fifth day, he is the fisher of men. On the sixth day, he is the man made in the image of God. On the seventh day, he is our rest. Whoa. Jesus is right there in the creation account? Yes, he is. Yes, he is. There's a, a system of study 
that, you know, when I came out of the hip-hop industry to follow Jesus, like, I didn't have anyone to teach me how to study the Bible. So when I went to the Bible, I was just kind of reading it in my hip-hop mind. And in my hip-hop mind, because I was an artist, I guess what I was looking for without even realizing it was unique ways of seeing the Bible. Like a hip-hop artist would do, you know. You're going to write lyrics. You're going to try to write lyrics as poetically as you can. And so the Lord took that in me and said, okay, here's how I want you to see the Bible. And the things I was seeing, I was like, at first I was like, yo, I'm about to put this in my rhymes. But as I began to move away from that, I was still studying the Bible in the same way. And I was like, well, wait a minute. And so people began to ask me, hey, how do you study the Bible like that? How, do, how are you seeing these things? And, and after years and years of, of getting this question and beginning to teach people, I, I, I um, kind of, cre- now I'm not going to say created a system, but it is a system that I call phototheology. It's the way I study the Bible. Phototheology is very simple. It is studying the Bible through the use of images, pictures. Have you ever heard the saying, a picture is worth a thousand words? Yeah. Because when you see a picture, it speaks more to you than possibly a thousand words. You can, you, can, you can get the meaning from one image that it might take you a thousand words to write. So what is phototheology? It's looking at the picture and knowing what you're looking for in the picture. Ellen White says these words. She says, when we study the Bible, we should should take pictures of what we're studying, and then she says we should hang them in memory's hall. How many of you got a picture when I said that? A picture in your mind. Did y'all see a hallway? Did y'all see, like, pictures, different pictures? There's a, like, imagine yourself as a photographer, right? And you're just going through the Bible. Oh, yeah, that's from the, yeah, And you're just taking pictures at different angles. And you're just hanging them in the wall. Why are we doing that? We're doing that because what's going to happen is that the Holy Spirit is going to be, begin to take. So you might be reading your Bible one day, and you notice that on the third day of creation, the first fruits came out of the ground. And then you're like, wait a minute, wait a minute. Isn't Jesus called the first fruits? And I took a picture of that. He's called the first fruits. And yo, wait a minute. He came forth out of the ground on the? <sighs> I have my next devotional. <laughs> You begin to compare pictures. So let me show you how this works. <clears throat> I'm going to paint a picture for you, and I'm just going to see what y'all, what y'all think. So how many of you remember the story of Moses as he goes up the mountain because he, the, the children of Israel are fighting with the Amalekites below. And God tells Moses to go on this mountaintop and to lift up his hands. And every time his hands are extended, the children of Israel experience victory. And when his hands come down, they begin losing. Y'all remember that story? All right, so Moses, here's a picture. Moses is on top of the mount, and his hands are stretched out. And every time his hands are stretched out, he experience, they experience victory. Moses is on a mountaintop. His hands are stretched out. And every time his hands are stretched out... Every time his hands are stretched out, they experience victory. Now his hands begin to get tired. So what happens? Aaron stands on one side of him and her stands on the other side of him. And now they're holding up his hands. Now, y'all look like y'all are getting excited. And all I've done is told you a story that you all know. But you're responding in a really weird way right now. If other people came in here and so, they'd be like, why are y'all getting like, <gasps> what happened just now? You ran down Memories Hall and you're like, wait a minute, I've seen that picture somewhere before. Where have I seen that? Oh, yes. 
Where did you see it? Jesus on the cross. And now you can see. Wait a minute. It's not the nails <laughs> that held his hands upon the cross. It was the sinner on either side of him that kept Jesus there. He died both for those that would re reject him and those that would accept him. I've seen that story before, and I, I was looking at zigzag lines. Listen, y'all. It takes practice. How many of you remember a gentleman by the name of uh, Waldo? Waldo? Where's Waldo? Y'all know the books, right? What do you know about those books? What can you know for certain about those books? On every page, Waldo is there. The objective is to do what? Find Waldo. Now, you might spend days and weeks, why can't I find Waldo? But you know Waldo is there, and that's what says, that's what makes you go, I'm going to find him. If it's the last thing I'm doing, I'm going to find Waldo. Beloved, the Bible has Jesus on every page of it. And the reason why many of us come to the Bible and then we walk away like, man, why would I spend time on zigzag lines? Is because you're not doing that thing with your eye, which is to not cross them, but to focus on the cross. Do you remember the story of David and Bathsheba? Do you remember how in that story uh, David uh, commits adultery with Bathsheba and then y'all are still looking at, y'all are just like, we're hearing you, Pastor, but we're trying to. <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's what I want you to do with the Bible. That's what I want you to do with the Bible. Listen, David commits adultery with Bathsheba and then he has her husband killed, Right? And then the prophet Nathan comes to David and basically says, you know, God knows what you did. I know what you did. You're guilty. And then David repents. And, and, and Nathan says, because you repented, you will live. Is that a, How many of you say praise God for God's mercy? But I mean, come on now. Think about what David did, y'all. He killed the woman's husband. Now, Nathan doesn't stop there. Nathan says, because you have sinned, because you have done this thing, and you've repented, you will live, but the child, because remember Bathsheba was pregnant, right? The child you have is going to die. Now, that's a messed up story. How many of you would agree that's a messed up story? So, we don't know anything about this child. The child is not given a name. All we know is that this child was what? Male or female? Male. It was a male child. That would make this male child who? Not the daughter of David, but... The son of David, listen to me, y'all. The son of David in this story is brought into the world on account of somebody else's sin. And even though he does no wrong, he's innocent. Y'all. <laughs> even though he does no wrong, he dies in the place of the wicked. Are y'all catching this? How many of you know this story? Yes, you've read it before, maybe many times, heard, and you've been like, man, that's a mess up story. Or why is this story in the Bible? And now all of a sudden, something, I, I, now listen, y'all, I haven't said anything. I'm just telling you the story. Right? And I'm just emphasizing the specifics of the story. And now y'all are like, hold on. Wait a minute, I read that story a hundred times. How'd you do that just now, Pastor? I didn't do anything. 
I haven't done anything. I'm just telling you the story of the Bible, you know. The same stories y'all, y'all grew up hearing at bed. To, uh, I'm just telling you those same stories. But for some reason, y'all are like, yo, wait. How many of you feel a fire? How many of you feel something going in your heart like, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. I need to go back to the, to the Bible and look at, I have my next devotion. If I'm ever called to give a Bible study, I know what I'm about to do. <laughs> Beloved, listen, the scripture is full of this. It is full of this. So let's, let's do another picture. Can we do another picture? All right. So um, let's take the story of Elijah and Elisha. Elijah and Elisha. Okay. So who is greater? Who comes first, Elijah or Elisha? Elijah. So it's Elijah and then Elisha, right? And here's the story. Elijah is about to be taken up, taken off the scene, right? And so Elisha, Elijah asks Elijah, ask one thing, what do you want? And Elijah says what? Give me a double portion of your power. So who's more powerful, Elijah or Elisha? Elisha. Okay. There's a transition of power then from Elijah to Elisha. Where? How many of you remember where that happened? At the Jordan. So there's a transition of power from Elijah to Elisha at the Jordan. Elijah is about to be removed from the picture. (laughs) The disciples of Elijah go on to follow Elisha. Elisha's first miracle after crossing the Jordan is he provides drink for the thirsty. Now, I have a question for you. (laughs) Why are y'all so excited? I'm just telling you the plain old Bible stories that you know y'all are like, oh, we heard it before. I'm just, that's all I'm doing. I'm just telling y'all Bible stories. And y'all are like, wait, what? Do y'all remember that Jesus said that John the Baptist was Elijah? Do you remember that? John the, Jesus said John the Baptist was, a, he's not saying he was literally Elijah, but he was saying he is compared to Elijah. So let me ask you, if Jesus himself said John the Baptist is Elijah, then pray tell. Who would Elisha? But I want you to understand that, that Jesus, John the Baptist said, his shoes I am not worthy to bear. Remember that. And remember it was at the Jordan that there was this transition of power, if you will, from John the Baptist to Jesus. You remember that John the Baptist is taken off the scene. He is beheaded after that. And the disciples of John go on to follow Jesus. And Jesus' first miracle is turning water <laughs> You know what I like? I like that y'all are like, yo! <laughs> I mean, it's not what you would expect to hear in a Bible study, but you get the picture now. Because when I came into the church, it, for me, it was just full of yo, yo. I mean, it was just my way of expression. Yo! What? Wait a minute, does anybody else know this? All right, if they don't know this, it's my responsibility to tell them. Because I cannot keep this to myself. Okay, more pictures? Let's do some more pictures. There are four offices in the Old Testament. Four offices. Um, I need you all to help me out. What are those offices? There is king, priest, prophets, and judges. Kings, 
priests, prophets, and judges. Okay, so which office comes first in, in terms of focus? It's prophets. So think of, uh, think of Noah, right? Think of Enoch. Think of Joseph. The office is prophets. Okay, and, and basically that's the focus of Genesis. What's the next office? Which office comes next? Priests. The book of Exodus. Right? The introduction of the priesthood. Right? The sanctuary. So you got, you got the prophets first and then priests. And then what comes next? Judges. And then the last office? Kings. The whole Old Testament then is basically this order. Prophets, then priests, then the judges, then the kings. <laughs> Prophets. <laughs> priests. <laughs> Judge. Is king. <laughs> Do y'all understand that the entire Old Testament? The entire Old Testament is a revelation of Jesus Christ in that when he came to this earth, he came as a prophet. He died, was buried, ascended to become our priest. One day, judgment begins at the end of which he returns as king of kings. Look at your. Is this being recorded? Because y'all, y'all not gonna believe. It. I was actually like clapping at the scriptures just now. You guys, I want you to understand this. If you're if you're going to the Bible and then walking away like mm, I did my devotion today, you're eventually going to stop doing that. Because who wants to read zigzag lines? Who wants to spend time every day? Have you looked at your zigzag lines today? Yes, I read the zigzag lines today. Because that's what we're basically doing. If we're learning how to focus our eye on what we need to focus on, all of a sudden, y'all, all of a sudden, your attitude towards the Bible begins to change. Because now you begin to realize that the, that the Bible is full of hidden treasure. And, and, and Lord, I want you to help me find the treasure. So every day should be like a treasure hunt. All right, what am I about to find in the scriptures today? What is the Lord about to show me in the Bible today? All right. What, how much time do we have? Ten minutes? Okay, cool. Um, let's do this. Let's go to Leviticus. Anyone have a Bible on them? Have their Bible on them? Let, I want someone to read for me Leviticus chapter 12. Leviticus chapter 12. And I want you to read uh, verses 1 through 5. Leviticus chapter 12. You got it? Okay, go ahead and read. Leviticus 12 verses 1 through 5. Okay, um, verse 6. Okay. 
Can you read one? Go ahead. Keep reading. Okay, and then it says, then she shall be clean. Right? Next verse. Okay. <clears throat> so here's this. Now, this is the book of Leviticus, you know. You're definitely not supposed to be reading this book because this book is just a whole bunch of zigzag lines, right? So we just skip Leviticus and go to Matthew. Okay. <clears throat> so in Leviticus 12, here's what we just read. If a woman bore a male child... She was to be unclean for 33 days. At the end of the 33 days, there was to be a sacrifice that purified her, and she would then have access to the temple. So I could just sit back and enjoy this. Y'all keep going. Go ahead. <clears throat> I'm just going to watch y'all. Just... This is a, yeah. So let me just explain it again. Um, if a woman bear a male child, who is the woman, y'all? The church. Who is the male child, y'all? Jesus. 33 days she was to be unclean, signifying Jesus' 33 years on earth. At the end of the 33 days, there was to be a sacrifice, Jesus' death on our behalf. That death gives the woman, <clears throat> makes the woman clean and gives her access. To heavenly places. <sighs> what if Bible study was like this for you all the time? Now listen, y'all, here's the problem, right? You're waiting for somebody like me or the pastor or the elder or your Bible teacher. You're waiting for someone to bring this to you when Jesus is saying you can go directly to the source yourself. You can get this for yourself. Nobody taught me, y'all. <clears throat> Do you understand? <clears throat> Imagine yourself, right, where you are right now, and then some guy walks in here who is in the hip-hop industry, who knows nothing about Adventism, and he just walks in for the first time, and he's like, go ahead, Pastor, preach. <laughs> How much more do you know than that guy? Biblically speaking, I'm asking, how much more do you know than that guy? A whole lot more. <clears throat> So here is that guy right now, 20 odd years later. What I'm saying is don't think, man, I can't do it because who's going to teach me? Who taught me? The Spirit. And that same Spirit can teach you. Okay, one more. Two more. Two more. Um, let's see. Let's see. Let me see. There's something I want to share. Uh, all right. So, Noah. So, in the days of Noah, 
All right, listen to the story, y'all. In the days of Noah, salvation came through, let me say it this way. In the flood, salvation came through a man. Who was that man? Noah. Who was lifted up above the earth on wood. <laughs> Hi, how are you? You good? Good. In the days of Noah, salvation came through a man who was lifted up above the earth on wood. And all were drawn to him, but most too late. The name Noah means rest. <laughs> Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. All right. One more. Let me think. Let me think. <clears throat> um, okay. Let's talk about Joseph. So Joseph um, was betrayed by his brothers, sold for silver. Look at y'all. Look at y'all. <laughs> Look at y'all. Where's my phone real quick? And uh, I'm going to just keep this going. And uh, <clears throat> so he is, remember he is falsely accused and therefore put into prison. He is between a butler and a baker. <laughs> he is between a butler and a baker. Um, by the way, he's put in the prison even though the guy that put him there knows that he's innocent. Oh. This is real. This is real. It's really happening. <laughs> um, he has a dream. And in the dream, one is going to be delivered at the end of three days. So at the end of three days, one will be redeemed, one will be lost. And now remember, as a result of this, Joseph then ascends to the second highest place in heaven, I mean in Egypt. Now remember, there's a famine in the land, right? So the very ones that had betrayed him now end up having to come before him. But Joseph, Joseph can, can let them into heaven, I mean, <clears throat> into Egypt. <laughs> but before he lets them in, he's going to investigate. Y'all not feeling me. He's going to investigate to see if they have changed. Almost done, almost done, almost done. 
Two minutes, two minutes. And, watch this, and how does he investigate them? Well, he wants to see how they treat, which one? The, who, who? The least of these, his brethren. The youngest. Because in so much as they do it unto him, they would have done it unto Joseph. Now, you remember the youngest of these, who was that? Benjamin, right? You know what Benjamin's name means? Well, first his mother said, call him Benoni, meaning son of sorrow, man of sorrow. But the father says, no, call him Benjamin, meaning son of the right hand. How you treat the least of these <laughs> is how you've actually treated me. This is a Sabbath school. <laughs> Wait till the divine service. <laughs> okay, so that's it. We're going to wrap it up, y'all. We're going to wrap it up. Listen to me. Listen to me. See that no just now? See that feeling in your heart like, nah, I don't want this to stop. That, that is what y'all need to be aiming for. <clears throat> Let chase after this like you would chase out after anything else in the world. Ask the Lord every day, Lord, okay, this might take me weeks or months or years to get this or to begin to understand the Bible like this, but Lord, bring this to me. Because if I have this... <clears throat> If I have this, the fire will never go out here. Thank you, Father, for speaking to us. May our hearts be set on fire is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. <laughs> amen, amen, amen. Well, that was definitely one of the most exciting Sabbath schools I've been a part of. Praise the Lord for that. Um, I just want to give you a quick reminder. We're going to just basically starting in two minutes. So if you have to use the restroom or anything like that, we're just going to have a quick break. And then we're going right into our service because we have a, a very full schedule. So two minute break. If you have been with us since yesterday, you know that this weekend has been a real blessing. I'm just going to give you guys a moment here. One second. All right. If you could quietly get to your seats. Thank you so much for coming all this way. I know I have been blessed uh, listening to what God has been sharing through Pastor Ivor. Uh, what an amazing testimony yesterday and what an amazing tool that he gave us in which we can use to study the Bible. Uh, praise the Lord for that. Just a few quick announcements. Uh, I do have, at the back we have a, a list. 39 BMA students have uh, signed it up. This list is only for BMA students. Um, those who are guests and want to join our outreach, you are more than willing to come uh, around 1.30. I know we're hoping to be done lunch by then. We may need a miracle for that, but we're going to try to be done lunch by 1.30. You're going to be coming back here um, we have uh, Jonathan who's over here, a little wave. He's going to be doing a quick training on our outreach. And we're going to be hopefully done by around 3.30 so that we can be back by 4 p.m. Um, at 4 p.m., uh, we we're going to have Pastor Ivor again sharing. Uh, he said he's going to be sharing a little bit of the, uh, his answers to some of the Q&A that the, everyone has been putting at the back. So he might not get to every question, but he's going to try to get to some. Um, there is a meal from 5 to 6 for those who have purchased tickets. Um, that will be at the cafeteria. And then from 7 p at 7 p.m., our sophomore class is something called a Lyceum. It's a bit of a fundraiser, and that's going to be in the gym. And so if you want to support, you want to spend some time uh, with some of our students and see what they have planned, feel free to join us for that. So thank you so much for coming. Um, we are so glad that you're here. And just though I am from a very cold place, we don't usually have it this cold in the church. We're trying to get that adjusted for you. But uh, if you are an adult, you can scooch closer to the person next to you. If you're a student, keep your distance. All right. Uh, 
Thank you so much. And I have a couple more announcements here from, uh, we'll go with um, whoever's next. Good morning, happy Sabbath once again. I have a quick announcement about, this is for young adults. So if you're born from 87 to what, 2005, I think is when you're 18, we have an activity or a program happening in December. It's December 15th through 17th. We're going to be talking about your spiritual gifts. So we're going to go to a retreat center. Have, has any of you guys heard of Refreshing Mountain? It's about 40 minutes from here. It's a great, I was there a, a month ago. It's really fun. They have things like zip lining, escape rooms, axe throwing, archery, that kind of stuff. So we're going to be spending a weekend there. and We have a speaker coming. His name is Edward Martin. He's a youth director down in Kentucky, Tennessee, and we're going to be talking about your spiritual gifts. So if you're 18 to 36, I invite you to come to that. We're going to talk about how you can not just discover what your spiritual gift is, but how you can apply it to discipleship, because it's important that we not only know what God has given us, um, what we can use for his glory, but how we can share that with others and help other people develop there. So if you guys are available on the 15th through 17th of December, uh, we have an activity planned. So uh, I'll have some flyers out on the back table, and feel free to pick them up and share them with a friend. God bless. Good morning. Happy Sabbath. I will tell you, I am so glad that you are here. Uh, my mentor always said, if you want to receive a blessing, walk in the pathway of blessing. Meaning this, that if you want to receive a blessing, go where a blessing is given. And for those that were here last night and this morning, you have already received a blessing. But you are choosing to be in God's presence. And for that, on behalf of the Holy Spirit and God, thank you. Thank you for opening your hearts to be here and to receive the Word of God. I'm glad that you're here. I know we have many people from many churches. And I'm glad. All the way, the furthest that we have is State College. State College in the house, where are you guys at? Oh, all over the place, all up, over the place. Anybody come from further? I see some people that were State College, but a.k.a. also Bethlehem area. Yes. Anybody further than, how long of a drive was that? Two and a half hours? About two and a half hours. We have a three hour from State College area. All right, where from? From Pittsburgh. Praise the Lord. We are so glad that you are here. And parents, thank you for taking an interest in your young people. This is for them. But also I want to share with you, the Pennsylvania Conference is highly dedicated to making things available to our young people. You know, all through the year we have different programs to have our young people involved in. Uh, like, for instance, you just heard Jonathan. Jonathan is uh, my associate in the youth department. He is associate youth director. And uh, his emphasis is over youth and young adults. That's the reason why he is talking about the young adult retreat coming up. Also, we have plenty of programming. And if ever you want to know of where that programming is, go on to our website. Just know that we always do send out advertisements to our pastors and bulletin secretaries. But I also know, like for instance, and there were a couple of churches and that were like, we didn't hear about it. And we're trying to work because we also realize that when you're in pastoral, um, when you don't have a pastor, uh, how does that information get to you if there's no person to uh, put an email to? So we're working with that, and I'm glad that you guys are here. But if ever you're interested to see what there is available for our young people, go to our website. That's the PennsylvaniaConference.org. Uh, there is a youth page, and there's uh, programs. There's an event page. Like, for instance, if you are... Jonathan, where's Jonathan at? Jonathan, what age do you start with li your literature program in the summer? So if you're between 16 to 25, we have a program for our young people to do literature evangelism, to go to our people here in Pennsylvania. It's an opportunity. I will tell you, I did it for two summers, 
It is a tremendous faith-building program that if that is something that the Lord calls you to, be a part of it. Also, some people are all like, oh, you're Mr. Laurel Lake. Because I also, I run Laurel Lake. How many have been to summer camp before? I know I've seen many of you. But if you are ages 16 on up and you want to work and be a missionary for Jesus at summer camp, it's available as well. Once again, I just want to say this. Wherever God is, God's presence is. And you have a choice of where you will be. If you choose to be in God's presence, you will be blessed because God's presence is there. And I'm just asking for you all, choose to be in God's presence each and every day. And on behalf of the youth department, uh, thank you for being here. And I'll pass it on over to our principal, Mr. Culpepper. Good morning, everyone. Happy Sabbath to you. On behalf of the staff and the students of Blue Mountain Academy, we'd like to welcome all our guests. It's nice to have a full house. This is what we envisioned when we have these kind of weekends. A few years ago, Pastor Casey and myself got together and we're like, we need a youth rally. There hasn't been one. And so this is a joint effort between, well, what really is the same household, um, the conference leadership, the youth department, and, of course, the uh, academy as well. So we're all working together. We're one big family. And we decided we need a youth rally. And so this is our time where we can kind of, Pastor Casey's on the road a lot. So this is one of those times we get to have him here. Um, and that's, uh, that's a huge blessing as well. So this teamwork we have is wonderful. And when I say on behalf of the students of well of the school, I know we had a lady come in uh, last week from our Berks County uh, Educational She's kind of like a, a leader. She's the director of the unit here. And she said, your students are so friendly. Did you know that, guys? Some came in and she said, everybody was like, how are you doing? Hey, how are you? Welcome to Blue Mountain. Hey, how are you? And she's like, what in the world are you doing here? That's you. And I hope you guys feel that warmth as well. I know we felt it a little bit last night and today as you guys started understanding um, what Pastor Meyer was saying. Uh, we're going to hear a lot more, so I'd like to welcome you. But before we get going, we have something very special we have to do. We don't have to do it, but we're choosing to do it. Um, you know we have two pastors here. So if I could call Pastor Adam and Pastor Tony down to the front, and um, if Annette Smith would come forward, she has something she would like to say. Uh, it's nice to see a full church. And you've been welcomed by the conference, you've been welcomed by the school, and as a member of the church, we'd like to welcome you as well. Uh, and as most of you know, October was Pastor Appreciation Month, and things are very busy here at BMA and BMAC, and it's hard to get them all at one time with the students and everybody together. So we're celebrating today our Pastor Appreciation and we're going to share it with you as well. Um, when you leave in the foyer, there'll be a light snack uh, on your way to the calf. So please take one. We hope we have enough because you are a very large group. And we have been secretively going around in the dorms and the church members, having them sign cards with little notes and some of the boys got theirs earlier to you, uh, but this is the girls in the church, and we want to give a heart welcome and glad you're here. All right, let's wrap this up and get me off of here. But as you know, um, you guys may not know, but the students know. Whenever we have a speaker, we do something very special. And we would normally do this at the end, but it's going to be a very tight schedule today as uh, Pastor Meyer has to make it to an uh, airplane, airplane tonight, and he's got to get to the airport. So um, we're going to do this now. So if, Pastor Ivor, if you would come um, forward, 
we have a special thing we do. I invite any student, anybody actually would like to, we come and make a circle around him, lay hands on him, and pray for his ministry. This is something special we do. Pastor Kim, if you remember, started this tradition, and we want to keep it going. So I invite anyone who would like to pray. I need uh, three students to pray. Okay, Lucas, Millery, Madison. If you can't make it close to him, just touch the guy in front of you or the girl in front of you on the shoulder. All right, we're going to start with Lucas. We'll go to Madison and then on to Millery and then back to me, and I will finish. All right, let's pray. Dear Jesus Christ, thank you so much that we've had the privilege to have uh, Pastor Ivor come here and preach to us. Thank you for his wonderful message and testimony of what it's like to enter in and be opened and see the light of your gospel, the truth, and the way to salvation. Please be with uh, Pastor Ivor with his ministry and his family. Please spread your protective arms and angels around him and his family because we know that the devil does not like it when some people go and try to spread the truth and to do your will. We know that he does everything possible to try and discourage us and to hit us and beat us down. But we know that with your help, God, that we can do all things through you. And now we can claim your name as our refuge. Please be with him and help him. Continue to bless him and his family with his ministry and to uh, help him to reach more and more people. Be with him as he preaches to us today and help us to listen and understand the words that he, we, he will be speaking. And thank you and in your name. Amen. Dear Heavenly Father, I just want to thank you so much for the opportunity to have Pastor Ivor here this weekend. I want to thank you for his ministry, his power, his words, that he has blessed um, every ear that is here today, Lord, with what he had to say. I ask that as we depart from this place later today, that this is not the end of the conversation that he has, but that you will continue to bless him and everyone that he comes in contact with. Thank you for the words that you have spoken through him. Thank you that he is such a blessing to us. Bless his family, his ministry, wherever he goes um, and wherever he's traveling to next. I ask that as he continues to go throughout his life, I hope that he recognizes that he is doing your will and that he inspires so many of us youth to do the same. I ask that as we are hearing all of this, that we um, continue to have our heart on fire for you, that we change our lives to uh, for the benefit of others and to show your Christ-like character, Lord. I ask that we continue to show that love to one another, to the visitors, and that we become more like you each and every day. Thank you for Pastor Ivor, and thank you for all that you have done for us and all the blessing and trials that we face, Lord. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Dear God, please bless Pastor Ivor and his ministry and his family. Um, help him to say the words that you want him to say, not just to say his own. Help us to look past the zigzags and see the uh, full picture of the Bible. Help us to understand what he's trying to teach us, that it can really go deep into our hearts, not just go through one ear and go out the other. Thank you for everything you've done and everything you continue to do. Please continue to bless him and his family and to keep him safe. In the name of Jesus, we and pray, amen. Father, as we close this prayer time, I pray that you will be with Pastor Ivor today as he presents the message. But not only that, you know, the devil is not happy. He's not happy when the message gets preached. He's not happy with an organization like he's starting is, that is reaching many people. So we pray that you protect his family, that you protect him. Be with his voice as he continues to lift up, lift up truth. Help him never to lose the courage to do this. And may his family be a driving force behind him. And uh, may he just be a wonderful witness. Be with him again today. Open up our hearts and our ears. May we hear what you have to say. In your name I pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.
Very good. Well, uh, we have a little uh, health minute. Have you ever been involved in a bad deal? I have. You know, one time I bought this thing, cost a little bit more than $1,000 on eBay, and the thing was fake. <laughs> good thing for eBay protections. You know, I was able to return the thing, and they return my money. But you know, many people are involved in a bad deal every morning. Every uh, many households start their day with a cup of coffee and they don't realize they're getting a bad deal. Caffeine, a cousin of cocaine, nicotine, and other ins, actually is not the best thing for your body. Some people say, my doctor, I need this stuff. If not, I don't function. Well, there was a very interesting study that was done from Bristol University showing that caffeine only makes you alert to a normal levels. In other words, if you're a regular caffeine user, you're messing up with the chemistry of your brain and you need the caffeine just to feel normal. The people that don't use caffeine actually are normal all the time. <laughs> Talking about a bad deal, isn't it? <laughs> Common sources of caffeine include coffee, tea, soft drinks, chocolate, and some pain relievers. This study from uh, ABC News, this lady took a functional MRI to detect how much blood flow was in her brain and then took one cup of coffee and repeated the study. This is the brain before the caffeine. Notice the redness all over the brain. This is the brain after the coffee. 40% decrease of blood flow to the brain. No wonder this is true. Drink coffee, do stupid things faster with more energy. <laughs> no blood flow, bad decisions. Look at this study. They had this spider. They injected this poor spider, showing the normal spider web, and injected the equivalent to two cups of coffee, the amount of caffeine, of course, you know, according to the size of the spider. This is a spider web it made. <laughs> After 48 hours, it did this. <laughs> it took 96 hours to get this toxic substance from the body. This is my study. And in this study, we were documenting how people that drink coffee on a regular basis have problems with their conscience, are more likely to pick up other addictions, have problems with their sleep, become irregular, eat less fruits and vegetables, and actually their nourishment is affected secondary to that. This is another one of my studies. In this study, we were documenting how people that drink coffee are more likely to have something that is called inflammation, which increases your risk of cancer and many other problems. And the list goes on and on and on and on of the health effects of caffeine. You can go, for example, this uh, website, Healthline, just a, a mainline uh, educational health uh, website showing how it increases confusion, it increases risk of depression, it increases anxiety, irritability, cancer, stomach problems, diarrheas, muscle aches, uh, infertility, blood pressure programs, and I could continue with the list on and on and on and on. You're getting a bad deal. <laughs> so what are we going to do if, if we want to have that victory over caffeine? Well, you know, it's funny because I never seen somebody addicted to broccoli. <laughs> See, because broccoli is not addictive. Yet, Caffeine, if you take it on a regular basis and you stop it, how are you going to feel? See, it's going to start affecting your nervous system. So eat a good breakfast with lots of whole grains, drink plenty of water, deep breathing, aerobic exercise, and some hydrotherapy. Hot water followed by cold water. I'm telling you, I guarantee it's going to wake you up and give you that energy that you need. But thanks God, thanks be to God who gives us victory through whom? Our Lord Jesus Christ. Don't get in a bad deal, get a good deal. Thank you very much.
One, two. Happy Sabbath, everyone. One more time. Happy Sabbath. That's much better. Our first song will be Standing on the Promises. So let's all stand on the promises of God. Standing on the promises of Christ my King, through eternal ages of His praise is framed. For in the highest I will shout and sing, standing on the promises of God. promises I cannot fail when the howling storms of God and the fear of sail by the living word of God I shall prevail standing on the promises of God standing 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 on the promises of God my Savior for our last hymn, Holy, Holy, Holy. Jesus, thank you for this day you have given us, Lord. Thank you for another day of life. Thank you because we have this amazing speaker that you have brought to us. Let us be filled with the Holy Spirit and to pay attention to what he has to say. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Good morning and happy Sabbath. Today's offering will be going to the local church budget. Some people receive a regular income for their work, such as pastors and teachers, bank tellers, and other hourly or salaried employees. They can plan accordingly. Their tithes remain constant, and their offering might also be constant, even though some of their expenses might fluctuate, while others remain steady. Other people might get paid in bursts with a regular amounts of each time, like farmers who harvest their crops, salespeople on commissions, restaurant waiters, and Uber and Lyft drivers. Their tithes and offerings fluctuate just like their income. When the Jews gathered for three major religious festivals each year in the Old Testament times, according to Deuteronomy 16, 16, and 17, no one should appear before the Lord empty-handed. Each of you must bring a gift in proportion to the way the Lord God has blessed each of you. Notice this last sentence. Each of you must bring a gift in proportion to the way the Lord has blessed you. How much has God blessed you? Bring God, bring God a gift in proportion to his blessing. Tithing makes that pretty simple. One-tenth of your paycheck. The same, way, the same can be said of your offerings. Give in proportion to the way God has blessed you. Maybe we need to pause and count our blessings. Don't give what you can't or merely give what you can Instead, give according to God's blessing to you. Let's bow your heads for prayer. 
Dear Lord, thank you so much for the Sabbath you've given us. Um, please accept our gifts today. Um, and may you just bless the rest of the Sabbath that we have. In Jesus' name, amen. I now call upon the deacons to collect the offering. Happy Sabbath, church. I invite you all to please kneel with me to have a word of prayer. Dear Father, thank you for this day, Lord. Thank you for all the things that you have done for us, Lord. Thank you for the good things as well as for the bad things in life, Lord. Help everything make us get closer to you. I pray for this congregation today, Lord. I pray that your spirit be in the midst of us, Lord. May our hearts be opened and that our minds may be filled with your word. I pray for all the burdens, Lord, that each and every one of us may have here at BMA or at home, Lord. And may you be with us wherever we go. Thank you for the preacher, Lord. 
may you stay with him. May the words that he say may not be his, Lord, but yours. Thank you because until now we, are, we have heard so many things and our hearts have been opened, Lord. Help that fire stay with us here and forever. Help us be able to share that holy, your holy word, Lord, and help us get closer to you. I pray for all of the visitors that we have here, Lord, on campus. We thank you for their presence here, Lord, because it warms us to see that there are many more people, Lord, that want to hear of you. I pray for these things, and I pray for your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.
All right. Uh, happy Sabbath, everyone. <clears throat> uh, so, um, yes. Amen. Amen. All right. Um, have you guys been blessed so far? Amen. 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 Um, we are going to be uh, looking at a very special presentation today. In fact, we're going to be watching a movie this morning. Um, but it won't be a movie in the sense of, uh, you know, what you would typically think of as a movie. We're going to be watching this on the screens of your mind. And uh, what we're going to do, and then we're going to have a word of prayer, we're going to jump right in, is we're going to uh, go through the entire Bible from Genesis to Revelation. Don't be nervous. We're going to juice the Bible down. Uh, we're going to go through the great controversy theme, and we're going to do it in a movie format. Why? Because a picture is worth a thousand words. And by the way, you remember something better if you watch it in a movie format than you do any other way. So um, be prepared um, to learn more than you probably ever have in an hour and some change period. All right? Uh, let's pray. And then we're going to get into this movie. By the way, the name of the movie is The Blueprint, Earth's Final Movie. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we ask, Lord, that you would bless us as we open your word. Lord, I'm praying that you would take this message and write it on the hearts of your people. Lord, these young people are here to understand. Lord, may they understand their destiny today is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Um, so we're going to begin. In this movie, there are six scenes. We're starting with scene number one. And we're going to basically take a look at the great controversy from heaven past all the way to heaven future. We're going to begin by simply setting the stage. We're going to be dealing with scene number one, which is the rebellion in heaven. Um, let's go ahead and gonna, we're going to go to the book of Hebrews chapter 4 to set the foundation. Uh, now, every now and then I'm going to check with you. Just, I'm just going to ask you, are you with me in the movie so far? And if you can respond, amen, so that I can know you are with me. All right? Are you all ready? Amen. All right. The Bible says in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 9, There remaineth therefore a rest to the people of God. Let us labor therefore to enter into that rest, lest any man fall after the same example of unbelief. So let's break this text down very quickly. Paul is writing here. And he's using this idea of there remaining a rest to the people of God. He's basing it off of the Old Testament Israel and their journey from Egyptian captivity into the promised land. So he's saying, listen, just as the Old Testament children of Israel had a journey from Egypt into the promised land, so there remains a rest for us in these days. We are on a journey to where? To heaven. So he's saying, let us uh, be diligent about this journey to heaven lest we fall after the same example of unbelief and do not enter. Now, if I were to ask you then, give me another name for heaven in this verse, what would you say? There's another word for heaven here. Let us labor therefore to enter into that what? Rest. Okay, very good. Now, the Greek word for rest here is the word sabbatismo. Say that word with me, everyone. Ready? One, two, three. Sabbatismo. So if I were to ask you, give me another name for heaven in the Greek, you would say sabbatismos. Now, why does God, Paul use this word sabbatismos? Rest to re represent heaven. It's because in heaven there is rest from sin. There is rest from war. There is rest from rebellion. And this is exactly why the Old Testament children of Israel looked at the promised land, the land of Canaan, as the land of rest. Because God promised them there would be no war, no rebellion once you come into the promised land. It will be a land of rest. Are you with me so far? 
All right, so number one, we've seen that before sin entered, heaven was God's, give me the Greek word, sabotismos. Okay, very good. Point number one, here is point number two. In the book of Hebrews chapter 8, Paul says, Now of the things which we have spoken, this is the sum. We have such a high priest who is set on the right hand of the throne of the majesties in heaven, a minister of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle, which the Lord pitched and not man. So Paul here in Hebrews 8 is basically saying that in heaven there is something called a sanctuary. Now, the sa how many of you have heard of the sanctuary? Raise your hand, please. The sanctuary, think of it like this. The sanctuary would be the white house of the universe. Does that make sense? It's the place from which God operates his government. And this is why the Bible says in Psalm 77, 13, Thy way, O God, is in the sanctuary. Okay, so understanding this, we see two things. Number one, heaven was God's sabbatismos. Number two, the sanctuary is where God's methods and ways are found. So if we want to understand God, one of the best things we can do is study the sanctuary because it is the white house of God's universe, of sabbatismos. Okay, so we've got those two points. The sanctuary served as a shadow or a blueprint the earthly sanctuary that God instructed Moses to build served as a blueprint of the heavenly sanctuary. So let's go ahead and break down this sanctuary very quickly. We need all of this for our movie. So number one, there was a gate that entered, that you would enter in to get into what was called the outer court. Then there were six articles of furniture. How many articles of furniture, everyone? Six. These six articles of furniture were, number one, the altar of sacrifice. Now, this pointed to the fact that Jesus would die on the cross as our sacrifice. Amen? Amen? Then there was the laver, and this is where the priests would wash their hands and feet uh, before they entered into the tabernacle itself. And often their hands and feet, you know, their hands had blood on them because they were sacrificing animals. So this is where they would wash. You would often find water mingled with blood here. The laver is a symbol of baptism. Are y'all with me so far? All right, let's go. The candlestick, the seven-branch candlestick pointed to, which was in the holy place, by the way, uh, pointed to the people of God. The Bible says, you are the light of the world, right? No man uh, lighted the candle and put it under, under a bushel, but on a candlestick that it may give light to all that are in the house. So the candlestick represents the people of God. The table of showbread represented what? The word of God, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. And then you had the altar of incense, which represented the prayers of the saints. Now, once you got into the most holy place, this is where you had the Ark of the Covenant that had what? The law of God in it, and on top of it was the mercy seat, and then there were two covering cherubim on either side of the mercy seat. This is the most holy place. By the way, the, the, the um, Ark of the Covenant represented the throne of God. The mercy seat represented the throne of God. So if the mercy seat represented the throne of God, then the foundation of the mercy seat would be the law of God. Are y'all with me so far? So this this, uh, uh, these six articles of furniture then demonstrate to us the principles of God's government. Let me say this. These six articles of furniture are like God's hieroglyphics. If you can understand these six articles of furniture, you have everything you need to understand the entire Bible from Genesis to Revelation. Nobody's excited, but that's okay. Y'all will get there. So let's take a look at how this works. So, for example, we can now know how heaven was God's sabbatismos, place of rest, place of peace, based on the principles of these six articles of furniture. For example, would you say that heaven was, a, was an atmosphere of self-sacrificing love? Would you say that heaven was an atmosphere of purity? Was heaven an atmosphere sustained by the word of God? Was heaven an atmosphere of open communion with God? Was heaven an atmosphere of light? Was heaven an atmosphere of law? Was heaven an atmosphere of mercy? 
Absolutely. These six articles of furniture show us the atmosphere of heaven. Not only that, the six articles of furniture show us a picture of who God is. Is God a God of love? Is God pure? Is God our sustainer? Give us this day our daily bread. Is God our friend? One we can talk to. Is God light? Is God just? And is God merciful? Yeah, so the sanctuary shows a picture of who God is. Are y'all with me so far? All right, so far, so good. So now we're about to be introduced to an angel by the name of Lucifer. The Bible says here um, in Ezekiel chapter 28, thou art the anointed cherub that covereth. Now pause for a second. That should ring a bell to you. That should ring a bell to you. The anointed cherub that covereth. Wait a minute. Didn't you just say, Pastor, that in the most holy place there were two angels called covering cherubim? These are the two angels that stood closest to the presence of God, which now lets us know that Lucifer was one of those two angels that stood closest to the presence of God. His job was that he was anointed cherub that covered. Now remember, these two covering cherubim in the sanctuary, what were they covering? The Ark of the Covenant. What's in the Ark? The law of God. So if you're covering something, it means you're protecting it. Lucifer's job description in heaven was to protect and show the holiness of the law of God. Are y'all with me so far? The Bible says, Thou was upon the holy mountain of God and walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. Thou was perfect in thy ways from the day that thou was created until iniquity was found in thee. By the multitude of thy merchandise they have filled the midst of thee with violence and thou hast sinned. Therefore I will cast thee as profane out of the mountain of God and I will destroy thee, O covering cherub, from the midst of the stones of fire. Thine heart was lifted up because of thy beauty. Thou hast corrupted thy wisdom by reason of thy brightness. I will cast thee to the ground. I will lay thee before kings that they may behold thee. Let's keep reading. Thou hast defiled thy sanctuaries by the multitude of thine iniquity, by the iniquity of thy traffic. Therefore will I bring forth a fire from the midst of thee. It shall devour thee, and I will bring thee to ashes upon the earth in the sight of all them that behold thee. All they that know thee among the people shall be astonished at thee. Thou shalt be a terror, and never shalt thou be any more. The Bible says that Lucifer sinned. According to 1 John 3 verse 4, sin is the transgression of the law. Meaning, the very law that Lucifer was supposed to be uh, 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 showing the holiness of, he ends up turning against. Are y'all with me so far? The Bible tells us in uh, Isaiah chapter 14 how Lucifer rebelled. It says, How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground which didst weaken the nations? For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like... The Most High. Now, I want y'all to just look at me. Look at me, look at me, look at me, look at me. Don't look at the screen. Look at me. Look at me. Look at me. Don't look at the screen. Who is the Most High? Who is God? Our what? Our King? Our, 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 our Father? Is He the Holy Father? So Lucifer wanted to be the Holy Father. Lucifer wanted the title of Holy Father. Maybe down here works better. Lucifer wanted the title Holy Father. But that title only belongs to one individual. There is only one holy father. Are y'all with me so far? Okay, we're just talking about things that happen in heaven, right? Let's keep going. So he wanted the title of holy father. And by the way, watch this now. The, we know that Lucifer deceived one-third of the angels. So the question is, how did he deceive one-third of the angels? Did he say to the angels, hey, angels, let's be evil. 
No, no, no. Check this out, y'all. Lucifer's argument was a very profound one. His argument was, look, we are already holy. We can be like God without keeping his law. We don't need a law to tell us the difference between right and wrong. We can determine that for ourselves. And when you do that, you make yourself God. So, in essence, Lucifer was arguing on the, base, on the basis of righteousness. His argument was disguised under holiness. Lucifer wanted the title of Holy Father, and the reason it deceived a third of the angels is because it was done under a disguise of holiness. Mm, yeah. <clears throat> Are y'all following me so far? Have you heard arguments like this here on earth? Like we don't need a law telling us the difference between right and wrong. We're not under the law. We can do our own thing and still be Christian. Let's keep going. Let's keep moving. So, um, did Lucifer, was, was God, did God cast Lucifer out of heaven when he sinned? No. Because if there was a mercy seat in heaven, come on, y'all. <laughs> if there was a mercy seat in heaven, what does it indi indicate? That God would have extended mercy to Lucifer. Now, remember uh, uh, when G the disciples were talking to Jesus, and they said, Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me, and I forgive him? Seven times? Jesus said unto him, I say not unto thee until seven times, but until what? Seventy times seven. So then, I want you to think of 70 times seven as the number of what? Forgiveness. Are you all with me? 70 times 7 is a number of forgiveness. That means Lucifer, God extended mercy to Lucifer, but he eventually made his decision that he is not accepting the mercy of God. And as a result of this, as a result of this, the Bible says there was what? War in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought and his angels. Now, let me ask you a question. If there was war in heaven, and Lucifer was the originator of that war, then what did he break when he brought war to heaven? Give me the other word for peace, y'all. Lucifer broke the state of sabotismos. Oh, man. Let me try it on this side. <laughs> Lucifer broke the, the first thing he broke in heaven was sabotismos. Now, let me ask you a question. If, if the war in heaven revolved around sabotismos, the very first war, what do you think the final war? So, there was a time of mercy followed by a time of war where Satan seeks to desire to be like the Most High. Does he think to change God's times and laws? Y'all didn't catch that, did you? Did y'all catch that just now? Did Lucifer in heaven think to change God's times and laws? Did he break the state of rest, the sabbatismos? Did he war against the saints of the, I mean the angels of God? Did he desire to sit on the Father's throne between the cherubim? Did he blaspheme God's name? Let me ask you a question. How many of the angels did he deceive? Remember that number, okay? We're going to come back to that. How many, y'all? One-third, one-third. As a result of Lucifer's sin, the Bible says that the devil and his angels were cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceived the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. So was there a cleansing of the sanctuary? Was there a cleansing in heaven? So there was a time of mercy, a 70 times 7, followed by a time of war, followed by a cleansing in which Lucifer is cast out, he and his angels. Now, um, watch this, y'all. Watch this. God's hieroglyphic. Did Lucifer reject God's mercy? Did he reject God's law? 
Did he corrupt his communication with God? Did he reject God's word? Did he reject God's light? As a result, did he defile himself? The wages of sin is what? And he was cast out of the gates of heaven. Ooh. Wait, what? <laughs> Hold on. Let's keep moving. Let's keep moving. So, <clears throat> now notice that the Bible said that Satan and his angels were cast out into the earth. How many of you have a real problem with that? Satan and his angels were cast out into the earth. How many of you are like, yeah, wait a minute. Why did you cast him out on earth, God? Why couldn't you cast him anyplace else? Anybody ever thought about that? <clears throat> First Peter said, Second Peter chapter 2 says this, For if God spared not the angels that sinned, but cast them down to hell, and delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved unto judgment. So Second Peter says they were cast out into hell, while Revelation says they were cast out into the earth. So what's going on here? Y'all like, earth is the hell. Hell is the earth. Okay, watch, y'all, watch. The, the Greek word for hell here is the word tartaru, and it is only used one time. It means abyss. An abyss, y'all, is a place that is without form and void. So if you're thinking right now, wait a minute, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth, and the earth was what? Without form and void, and darkness was on the face of the deep. Oh, so God cast Lucifer out to this earth before he began creating on it. Okay, but all right, all right, but wait, still, why here? When he knew he was going to create us. So let's go to a principle in the Old Testament. This is Deuteronomy chapter 19, verses 16 through 18. God is laying out a principle here. Speaking through Moses, he says, If a false witness rise up against any man to testify against him that which is wrong, then both the men between whom the controversy is shall stand before the Lord, before the priests and the judges, which shall be in those days, and the judges shall make diligent inquisition. In other words... If there was a controversy that aro arose between two individuals, there had to be a third party, a jury. Why? Because the person doing the accusing, if he stands as judge, who's going to win the case? Him. If the person being accused stands as judge, who's going to win the case? Him. So God said there must be a third party to judge between the two. That's fair, right? So let's take this principle back into heaven. In this war in heaven, how many sides are there? Two. God and his angels, the devil and his angels. So remember what God said. God said to Lucifer when he was casting him out, I will lay you before kings that they may behold you. In other words, I'm going to lay you before kings that are going to judge you. So the question for us is, well, who are these kings? Who is this third party? Who is this third party that God is going to use to serve as jurors in this great controversy? Oh, 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 oh. Do you not know that the saints shall judge the world? Know you not that we shall judge? Whoa. Whoa. And now you know why Satan hates you. Now you know why Satan is trying to disqualify you from jury duty. You're going to use these people to judge me? They don't even know the difference between... <laughs> Yo, they think marijuana is all right. You're going to use these people to judge me? Watch this, y'all. Watch this. <clears throat> Let me ask you a question. Uh, well, first let me lay this out. In a, a juror, to be selected as a juror, there are four things that need to be met. Number one, you must have no first-hand knowledge of the crime. Where was mankind when Lucifer sinned in heaven? We were not even created. Number two, jurors must be law-abiding citizens. 
<laughs> Come on, y'all. Come on. When God created Adam and Eve, were they law-abiding citizens of the kingdom of heaven? Number three, a juror must know the difference between right and wrong. Did Adam and Eve, <clears throat> did Adam and Eve have the knowledge of good and evil? Did Adam and Eve know the difference between good and evil? Did God say to Adam and Eve, if you touch this tree, you will die. That is evil. So did Adam and Eve have the knowledge of good and evil? Yes. The devil tempted them with something that God had already given them. He wanted them to experience it. God said, look, I'm going to show you the difference between good and evil. The devil says, hey, man, you can know good and evil. Watch this, y'all. You can be like God without obeying his law. He didn't say to Eve, hey, Eve, would you like to be evil? He says, no, you can be like God, knowing good and evil for yourself. Number four, jurors must not be swayed by public opinion. Let me say that again. Jurors must not be swayed by public opinion. And so listen, if you knew that, a, if you were a criminal and you knew that a juror held your fate, a jury held your fate in their hands, what would you seek to do? But bribe the jury. And that's exactly what Lucifer does. And as a result of that, their judgment is distorted. They think they're going to become like gods. They, they, they sin against God. And now, my question again is, did they breach God's law? Did they reject God's word? Did they lose their light? Did they disrupt their communication with God? Did they defile themselves? The wages of sin is, and they were put out. However, there is a key difference because Adam and Eve acknowledged that they did wrong. You know, when, when Adam was like, she made me do it. <laughs> And then Eve was like, the serpent made me do it. They acknowledged they did wrong. That is the only difference between man and angel. Lucifer re refused God's mercy, whereas man acknowledged he had done wrong. And so now the plan of salvation kicks in. The plan of salvation is the plan to restore mankind to becoming jurors who know the difference between right and wrong, will not be swayed by public opinion, and are law abiding citizens of the kingdom of heaven. This is the end of scene one. Are y'all good? All right. So to recap, there was a sabbatismos. There was an introduction of sin and a time of mercy, followed by a time of what, everyone? Followed by a time of what? In which Satan is cast out into an abyss to be judged by newly created humanity. All right. That's scene number one. Scene number two. Scene number two, we're going to pick up in the Garden of Eden. There are six transitional figures. How many did I say, everyone? Six transit. Does that number ring a bell, anyone? There are six transitional figures from Adam to Moses or to Joshua, I should say. Uh, this is from Adam being put out of the garden to the children of Israel entering the promised land. So I want you to think of this kind of like as a cycle. Here we have Adam followed by Noah and then Abraham and then Isaac and then Jacob and then Moses. Now, did you know that, a that Adam uh, is the first man to offer up sacrifices? That's the altar of sacrifice right there. Yes? Then who did we say was next? Noah? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You remember that, that the laver is a symbol of what? Baptism. 
Noah, the flood, the earth being cleansed. Who do we have next? Abraham, who was called to be a light to the Gentiles. Now, after Abraham comes who? Isaac. Now, remember Isaac, his wife could not bear children. So the Bible says that Isaac entreated the Lord. Now, this is very interesting. That word entreated is literally translated incensed. He, in, he entreated, he prayed, he, 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 pray, he incensed the Lord. And that is how Isaac ends up with two sons, Jacob and Esau. Now, which one did the promise go through? Jacob. His name became Israel. And Israel was the father of 12 loaves of bread. I mean, 12 sons. 12 sons. Y'all remember the story of the 12 sons? <clears throat> they end up going down to Egypt. Remember that? And they spend 400 years in captivity. Israel spends 400 years in captivity before a man by the name of Moses comes on the scene who leads them to the mountain of God where they receive the Ten Commandments. How y'all doing? Are y'all are following in the movie so far? So remember, it is after Moses that Joshua comes on the scene and he's the one that leads the children of Israel into Sabbatismos, into the promised land. Could it be that what God is telling us is the way from being lost into the promised land is through the sanctuary? Thy way, O God, is in the sanctuary. Let's do another one very quickly. So now we're going to go just stay right there in Egypt. When the children of Israel are getting ready to leave Egypt, what is the first thing God tells them to do? Sacrifice a lamb. That's Exodus 12. That's a Passover. After the lamb is sacrificed in Exodus 12, they, they leave Egypt and Pharaoh begins to chase after them. And there's trouble because the children of Israel end up where? At the, at the Red Sea. <laughs> Somebody said, wait a minute. They cross through the Red Sea, which Paul tells us was a symbol of baptism. And after they cross the Red Sea, who knows what happens next? They're like, we're hungry. The Lord rains bread down from heaven for them. I'm glad y'all are enjoying this movie. The Lord rains bread down from That's Exodus chapter 17. In Exodus chapter, uh, Exodus chapter 16, in Exodus chapter 19 or uh, 17, God says to the children of Israel, you are my peculiar treasure. I'm calling you to be a light to the world. In Exodus 19, God tells Moses to tell the children of Israel to spend three days in prayer, in hard preparation. Why? Because in Exodus 20. So, it's here that God first introduces the sanctuary to the children of Israel. He's been walking them through the sanctuary without them even knowing it. And now he says, let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them. This sanctuary would be God's blueprint, God's GPS to show man how to move from being lost to finding God. To entering into the kingdom of heaven. Very interesting. When Solomon was making the, uh, the, the temple... Uh, the Bible says, moreover, the king made a great throne of ivory and overlaid it with pure gold. And then there were six steps to the throne. Uh, let me come down here and say it. There were six steps to the throne. There were six steps. Oh, man. Come on, y'all. There were six steps to the throne. No matter how far you think you are away from God, I want you to know that you're always only six steps away. Six steps away. Six articles of furniture showing us how to get to God. How many of you like the 23rd Psalm? Yeah, you know, it, there's six verses in the 23rd Psalm. The first verse, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. You remember that Jesus as the great shepherd laid down his life. <laughs> He also says, pick up your cross and do what? 
follow me. Then verse 2, he leadeth me beside still waters. Come on, y'all. Come on, y'all. He restores, verse 3, he restores my soul. How does Jesus restore us? How does he bring us back into right relationship with God? It is through his intercession. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, because why? Thy rod and thy staff is with me. You understand that seven-branch candlestick was symbolic of the rod. How many of you remember the story of Moses? By the way, the seven-branch candlestick, it budded, it blossomed, it bloomed. That's how the candlestick was built. It, it It was a tree. Let me just say it that way. It was a tree. It was a tree. And beloved, because of what Jesus did for us on the tree at the cross, we don't have to fear death because he made a way out of the gates of hell for us. Thou preparest a table before me. Thou preparest a table before me. Thou preparest a table before me. In the presence of my enemies. And then the last verse, surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the what, everybody? In the house. So here's this GPS. Here's how the GPS works. We know that if we want to be saved, the first thing we must do is accept Christ's sacrifice. By the way, do y'all see this? If you look at the, <laughs> if you look at the very shape of in which the articles of furniture were placed in the sanctuary. If I want to be saved, I must first accept Christ's sacrifice. But it doesn't end there. I must be baptized. Yes? If there were 10 demons here trying to stop you from accepting the cross, there are 20 telling you you don't need to get baptized. And there are 20 telling you you don't need to get baptized. There are 50 telling you that you don't need to study the Bible. You don't need to pray. You don't need to let your light shine. People will think you're weird if you're too excited about the word of God. And if there are 50 demons trying to stop you here, there's a billion demons trying to tell you you don't need to keep the law of God. The Sabbath? Oh, come on, don't worry about that. This is the GPS. Anybody ever been lost? and wanted directions from somebody, and then they gave you directions that sounded really good but weren't the right directions. Right, praise God for GPS, right? People have all kinds of, oh, you're trying to get to heaven? Oh, that's me. All you have to do is believe, and you're good to go. We know that's not true. Because those who believe must reveal that in what? In accepting Christ, in being baptized, in living out his life. Are y'all with me so far? All right, let's keep moving. So, God gives Israel this blueprint because he's trying to prepare Israel to bring the Messiah to the world. But what does Israel do? What do they do? They, in essence, begin to set up altars to other gods. They reject God's word. Do they reject God's word? Do they reject God's light? Do they burn incense to other gods? Do they reject God's law? Do they end up defiling themselves? And as a result of this, they end up in Babylonian captivity. The entire Old Testament is Satan's attempt to eliminate the sanctuary and the people of the sanctuary. Because it is the blueprint of salvation. So we are now... Guess where we are? We are now in the time of Babylon. The Bible says, moreover, all the chief of the priests and the people transgressed very much after the abomination of the heathen and polluted the house of the Lord which he had in Jerusalem. And the Lord God of their fathers sent to them by his messengers, rising up at times and sending because he had compassion on his people and his dwelling place. But they mocked the messengers of God and despised his words and misused his prophets until the wrath of the Lord arose till there was no remedy. Therefore he brought upon them the king of the Chaldees, and they burnt the house of God, and break down Jerusalem, and burnt all the palaces. Last sentence, and them that had escaped from the sword, carried he away to where? Babylon. All right, y'all, look at what we've just done. We just started from heaven past, and we are now, guess where? In the book of Daniel. 
where Daniel is a captive in Babylon. How y'all doing so far? So let's see, let's see what happens in scene three. That was scene two. Are y'all good? Are y'all following me in the movie so far? All right, now we're going to go to scene three. And scene three, we're introduced to the prophet Daniel, who is a captive in Babylon with a very special prophecy. Ah, can I just get excited by myself for a moment here alone, personally? So, so, the very first prophecy in terms of timing that Daniel is given is this prophecy called the 70 weeks. 70 weeks would be 70 times. Which we know is the number of mercy. The children of Israel are in Babylon because they have sinned and the the, the angel comes to Daniel and says, Daniel, I'm giving your people a 70 times 7. A, a period of mercy. How many of you have heard of the 70-week prophecy? Okay. We know the Bible says 70 weeks are determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city to finish the transgression, to make an end of sins, to make reconciliation for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, and to seal up the vision and prophecy and to anoint the most holy. Six things that are supposed to be accomplished in the 70-week prophecy. But I don't, have time to, to, I don't have time to show you the beauty of those six things as they relate to the articles of <laughs> So we're just going to bypass that. Wait, uh, trust me, trust me. <laughs> There's so much more. I, follow, follow. So, uh, uh, this 70 week prophecy, uh, remember now, they're in Babylonian captivity. The angel comes and says, 70 weeks, y'all got 70 weeks to get it together, to accept my mercy. So, the 70 week prophecy begins in the Medo Persian Empire. Because it begins after they leave Babylon. You're going to have 70 weeks. And if you count 70 weeks, which is 490 years, because in Bible prophecy, a day equals a year, then we come down, we go through the empire of Greece down to the time of Rome, specifically from around 27 to 34 AD. Guess who happens to appear right at that time? Jesus, the very one that if they accept, they will receive Mercy. Mercy. <laughs> Mercy. Are y'all following? So, guess what we've just done? We have just... Ju We're out of the Old Testament, y'all. We just, we just juiced the entire Old Testament. You now have an understanding, a basic understanding of the theme and flow of the entire Old Testament. How do you feel? So now we're in the New Testament. And I'm going to show you that in the New Testament, we're looking at the very same sanctuary principle. Because I want you to check this out. The very setup of the New Testament is based on the sanctuary. The first four books of the Bible are Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, which all deal with the sacrifice of Christ. Y'all. <laughs> Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John all revolve around the sacrifice of Christ. Then you have the book of Acts, which incidentally talks about the... <laughs> Now, from Romans all the way to Jude is about the importance of letting your light shine, connecting with God, and the importance of the Word of God. And then we get to the book of Revelation, which takes us right into the very throne room of God. Come on, y'all. Come on. So, so, we're in the New Testament now, and we now have Jesus, which his name is Emmanuel, meaning God with us. You see, in the Old Testament, God said, let them make me a sanctuary. The sanctuary on the outside looked very plain, but on the inside was the very presence of God. The sanctuary was placed right in the midst of the, tw of 12, of the 12 camps. And everywhere the sanctuary went, the 12 would follow. <laughs> let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them, God with us, Emmanuel. I want you to watch this 
Because the sanctuary shows us that Christ descended from his throne in heaven. He was the manna that came down. He was the light that came into the world. He lived a life of prayer. He was baptized at the age of 30 and then crucified. Let's flip it around. He was born in a manger among animals. He was born the Lamb of God. He was born to die for our sins. He was baptized at the age of 30. After his baptism, he goes up into the wilderness where he's tempted. One, two, three. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Three times. Three. You know what I love right now? I th this look. It's just, I just, so, 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 check this out. He's tempted three times. The first temptation, turn this stone. The second temptation, listen, uh, uh, I'm going to take you up onto, onto a high place, and I want you to offer a prayer. To, throw yourself down and offer a presumptuous prayer to God. He will hear you, and he'll deliver you. Third temptation, look, I know you came for your people, your seven-branch candlestick, your city set on a hill. That's why I took them to a mountaintop and showed them all the glories of the world. Bow down, and I'll give you your seven-branch candlestick. I'll give you your people. Jesus rejects, all, overcomes all three, and goes on to preach the law of God combined with the mercy of God. Um, remember Jesus' first sermon? The Sermon on the Mount? When he said, blessed are they who mourn. Because of what their sins have done to Christ, altar of sacrifice. Did he say blessed are the pure in that sermon? Yeah. Did he say blessed are they who hunger and thirst after righteousness in that sermon? Did he say blessed are the peacemakers in that sermon, those who, who seek to reconcile? Did he, say blessed are, did he say you are the light of the world in that sermon? Uh, did he say think not that I am come to destroy the law in that? Did he say blessed are the merciful in that? On the cross, was Jesus nailed in his feet? Was he nailed in his right hand and left hand? Did he die of a broken heart? Did he have a crown of thorns put up on his head? When they pierced his side, was their blood mingled with water? At the cross, Jesus was our lamb. Amen? At the cross, he was the fountain of life. Amen? At the cross, he was the bread of life broken for us. Amen. At the cross, he prayed, Father, forgive them. Did he not? At the cross, he was the light of the world. Was he not? And at the cross, Jesus sat on his throne. Let me break it down for you. When Jesus was crucified, he was placed on something called a sedulum. That means it was not the nails. Then he was nailed in his hands and feet. But what they would do was put, they would put a seat on the cross. It's called a sedulum so that the sufferer would suffer longer. He would go between sitting down on the cross because he got tired, but then his hands above his head, he's running out of breath, so he's got to stand up to catch breath. This made the suffering last longer. So in essence, what I'm saying is that Jesus was sitting down on the cross. He had a crown on his head. They wrote king of the Jews. And if that doesn't get you, remember God on his throne was flanked by two angels. One was for him. Mm -hmm. Are y'all with me in the movie so far? Yeah. So what does Israel do? Well, guess what? They reject his sacrifice. Do they not? They reject his desire for their purity. They reject, his pu they reject his righteousness. They reject his word. They reject his prayer of intercession. They reject his light. They reject his law. And in essence, they reject his mercy. And so Jesus said, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that killest the prophets and stoneth them which are sent unto thee, how often would I have gathered thy children together, even as a hen gathered her chickens under her wings, and you would not. Behold, your what? Your house 
is left unto you desolate. That sanctuary that y'all have been, 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 been praising, that sanctuary is no longer in service. The veil in the temple is about to be what? Rent in two, signifying that a new sanctuary, which is where? In heaven is going to be the central focus of salvation. Are y'all with me so far? Jesus said in Matthew 21, 43, Therefore I say unto you, the kingdom of God shall be taken from you and given to a nation, bringing forth the fruits thereof. This is where the Gentiles, both Jew and Gentile, come into place. At the cross, therefore, there's a transition from literal Israel to spiritual Israel, from earthly temple to heavenly temple. Are you all with me so far? And so, something very significant happens here. Um, because part of the seven-week prophecy dealt with the anointing of the most holy. By the way, guys, we're halfway there. Are y'all good? Okay, we got one more half of the movie to go, and then we're done. But are y'all, are y'all good? All right, okay. So, in the Old Testament, now I need y'all to catch this. In the Old Testament, when the Old Testament tabernacle was anointed by the presence of God, it, it, you knew God's presence was there because uh, um, fire descended and rested on top of the temple. It was called a tent in the Old Testament, right? So fire rested on the, on the tent or the tabernacle, meaning God's presence is here. Now, why is this significant? Because, y'all, on the day of Pentecost, <laughs> I need you to understand, on the day of Pentecost, see, in the Old Testament, there was one tabernacle. And the devil was like, I got to get rid of this tabernacle. I got to get rid of the people who are of this tabernacle. But in the New Testament, under the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, 3,000 tabernacles. On the day of Pentecost, when the, when the fire falls and is resting on the disciples, it is signifying that God is now setting up his home. Know ye not that you are the temple of the Holy Ghost and that the Spirit of God dwells in you. And so God is now, listen to me, y'all, the, the, the mission of the, of the early church was to set up as many sanctuaries as possible. Got to have the altar of sacrifice right here. Got to have the laver right here. Got to have the altar of incense right here. Got to have the candlestick right here. If you're really a sanctuary of God, these are the articles of furniture that you have dwelling in you. The law of God should be in the temple. Y'all didn't get there. Y'all didn't get there. The law of God must be in the (laughs) temple. Scratching my head. Just scratching these two parts. My temples hurt. Wow. The law of God must be written in the temple. Now remember, the the, the Jews as a whole were like, no, we're we're not doing this. So God calls a man by the name of Paul. Paul is going to be the missionary to the Gentiles. What's interesting about Paul is that his occupation, anybody know what his occupation was? (laughs) Yes, 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 yeah. Paul was a tent maker. <laughs> I know this is a lot. How many of you are like, this is a lot? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. He was a tent maker. So, so in tent making, you got to make sure that your tabernacles are set up with the gospel shoes, right? You got to have the gospel. So, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Let me go back here. You got to have the, you got to have the gospel shoes. Your loins need to be girt about with truth. You got to have the sword of the spirit. You got to have on the breastplate of righteousness. You have to have your faith tried like fire and you got to have the helmet of salvation. You know what I mean? You got to be fully armed with those six pieces of armor. <laughs> You got to be fully armed. Fully armed. So, so here's what, hap- well, here's what happens, right? The devil's like, man, I got to get rid of like all these sanctuaries now. So now he starts in the Roman Empire. He's like, okay, here's what we're going to do. We're just going to destroy these temples. But the problem is the more temples are destroyed, the more temples are popping up. So Satan's like, I got to change my tactic because straight out persecution from paganism, from just, you know, like like disbelief in God, that's not working. So if I can't beat them, I'm going to join them. (laughs) 
scene number four, the 1260-year prophecy. How y'all doing? Y'all good? 1260-year prophecy. So we know that in this prophecy, right, there are, uh, in the book of Daniel, there are four beasts that are mentioned. Lion, representing who? Babylon. And then bear, representing Medo-Persia. And then leopard, representing Greece. And then finally, dragon, representing Rome. And then there are what? Ten horns, among which rises a little horn. Now, notice what the Bible says here. The little horn is going to rule for how long? 1,260 years. That's the prophecy. That's the second prophecy of Daniel. Now, the Bible says, I considered the horns, and behold, there came up among them another little horn, before whom there were three of the first horns plucked up by the roots, and behold, in this horn were eyes like the eyes of a man and a mouth speaking great things. So, the Bible is here talking about the rise of the papal system. But I want you to note something there. The Bible says there were ten horns, and the little horn uprooted three out of the ten, which is roughly about what? What? It's roughly about... He shall speak great words against the Most High, think to change time, I mean, swear out the saints of the Most High, and think to change times and laws, and they shall be given into his hand until a time, times, and dividing of time. That's the 1,260 years. A time is 360 days. Times would be 720 days. And half a time, 180 days, totaling 1,260 days. But in Bible prophecy, a day equals a year. All right, very good. So, I, I need you all to understand something here. Because the Bible says that this same little horn would cast down the stars to the ground, magnify himself against Christ, would breach the sanctuary, and we know at the head of this power is a man who calls himself the Holy Father. Whoa. Pastor, are you telling me that the same thing Lucifer did in heaven under a disguise of holiness? Thinking to change times and laws, warring against the Sabbatismos, calling himself the holy, or wanting the title of holy. Are you telling me that this little horn is a mirror image of what Lucifer did in heaven? This little horn power we see would rise out of Rome, persecute God's people, breach God's law, uproot one-third, dominate Europe for over 1,200 years, speak blasphemous words against God, and will do it under a disguise of holiness. And now I want you to note this in the terms of our sanctuary understanding. Did this little horn, the Bible says he would defile the sanctuary. Did this little horn begin to teach that instead of, Instead of uh, the sacrifice of Christ being sufficient for sins, you have to pay money in order to be forgiven. Did this power begin to teach that because babies die and babies have sin on them, you got to baptize them, you got to sprinkle them before they die so that if they die, they'll be saved? So some of you asked that question a little bit, or maybe one of you asked that question about babies. This church taught that babies die, go to hell. So now I want you to imagine, what would that do to your picture of God if you, if you believe that babies who have done no wrong when they die, go to hell? You begin to think that God is a what? Is a tyrant. Remember we said the sanctuary was a revelation of the picture of God? If you change the articles of furniture and their meaning, you're changing what? The picture of God. So wait a minute. God is a God who demands uh, money to be forgiven? He's a God who's going to burn babies? What about this? What about this? Did this same power begin to teach that you can't study the Bible for yourself? That if you have a Bible, we will burn you? This same power, see that? See that uh, altar of incense? This same power set up a counterfeit mediation. 
they actually set up an actual room. It's called a confessional booth, which is a two-compartment room divided by a curtain. Y'all, <laughs> It's a two-compartment room divided by a curtain with a man sitting in the place of God claiming to have the power to forgive sins. The same power, that seven-branch candlestick, let your light shine, be a witness. The way that they witnessed was literally through fire. Convert or we will burn you. And finally, this same power went up into the Ark of the Covenant and said, no, Sabbath is not the seventh, the Sabbath is not the seventh day. We have power to change it to the first day of the week. By the way, at the head of this power is a man. Sitting on the throne, flanked by two angels. Sitting in the place of God. How y'all doing so far? All right. We got two more scenes, y'all. Are you good? Are y'all all right? Two more scenes and we're done. We got one more prophecy to cover. Scene number five is what is called the 2300-day prophecy. So, this is the final time prophecy in the book of Daniel. Angels are speaking. Daniel overhears them. Then I heard one saint speaking and another saint said unto that certain saint which spake, How long shall be the vision concerning the daily sacrifice and the transgression of desolation to give both the sanctuary and the host to be trodden underfoot? And he said unto me, Unto 2,300 days, then shall the sanctuary be? Let me rephrase this for you. It's as if he was saying, Unto 2,300 days, this, this will last for 2,300 days, then the holy place will be? Repair. Why would the holy place, why would the sanctuary need to be repaired? Because what did the little horn do to it during the 1260 years? It changed the truth of God. So, in other words, if I can rephrase it this way, at the end of 2300 years, all the error that had been pushed by the little horn would be restored to truth. Are, are y'all catching this? Now, if you have missed everything else, I need y'all to super duper focus here. I need y'all to li sit. Sir. Take a big breath. Breathe. All right. All right. Very good. Very good. Listen to me, y'all. Listen. What the prophecy is saying is that by the end of the 2300 years, the truth will be fully restored. Now. We're not going to take a whole lot of time to do this, but I need you to understand that in the book of Daniel, there is only one time prophecy. It is a 2300 days. But the 2300 days is broken up into different subsections. So the first section would be the 70 times 7, a time of mercy. Right? This is pointing to, from the Medo-Persian Empire to the Roman Empire. It points to the coming of Jesus. Then in the middle of the 2300 days is the 1260-year prophecy. This is the Dark Ages. But the very end of this prophecy, beginning in 457, you count 2300 years, brings you to the year 1844. What the Bible is saying is by 1844, the truths that had been lost during the Dark Ages will be fully restored. Let's see. Did that happen? Well, let's start with the 1300s. In the 1300s, there's a man by the name of John Wycliffe. Anybody know who John Wycliffe? Ever heard of John Wycliffe? John Wycliffe translates the Bible into the language of the people, effectively restoring the table of showbread. Can y'all say praise God for John Wycliffe? 
Praise God. Okay, so that's Wycliffe in the 1300s. In the 1400s, another man by the name of Martin Luther comes on the scene. And Martin Luther says, wait a minute. Forgiveness is not through penance. You don't have to pay to be forgiven. All you need is to accept the sacrifice of Christ. Martin Luther, who is the founder of the Lutheran movement, effectively restores the altar of sacrifice. Can we say praise God for Martin Luther? Amen. Praise God. In the 1500s, another man by the name of John Calvin, who is the founder of the Presbyterian movement, says you don't have to pray through priests and popes. You can have direct access to God. You can pray directly to God yourself. Calvin effectively restores the altar of incense. Can you all say amen? amen? In the 1600s, John Smith and Roger Williams become the founders of the Baptist movement. They are saying, listen, it's not about infant sprinkling. You've got to be fully submersed. You must be able to know the difference between right and wrong, meaning you must have knowledge of right and wrong and accountability, and that's what true forgiveness is. They effectively restore the labor. Can y'all say amen for the Baptist movement? In the 1700s, John Wesley becomes the founder of the Methodist movement. Wesley has a passion for letting your light shine, for evangelizing, for spreading the gospel. And Wesley effectively restores the work of the candlestick as the founder of the Methodist movement. Can y'all say praise God for the Methodist movement? We have one article of furniture left, which brings us down to the 1800s. And the question is, the question is, uh, 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 the question is, uh, what movement? <laughs> what movement is God going to bring on the scene by 1844 to restore the changed law of God? <sighs> Listen to me, y'all. <laughs> You want to know why I've spent the last 28 years like this? Ugh! This is why, y'all. You can't make this stuff up. There is no movie on the planet like this that y'all are watching right now. And y'all are in the movie. Okay. So watch this. There was, there was a football game, and I can't remember all the details of it. There was a football game many years ago. They called it the play. I think it was, it was a college football game. Can anyone help me out who the teams were? It was uh, Stanford and California, Cal State. And I don't remember which side was which, but there was like five, four seconds left in the game. And when they, they, had, they were up by one touchdown. And so all they had to do to kick the ball off and stop the other team from scoring. And so they, they kick the ball off, and the other opposite team catches the ball, and the announcer's talking, he's like, they have the ball. And people are leaving because they think the game is over. They think the game is over. The first guy gets the ball, and he begins running, and he gets tackled. There's no time left on the clock. The clock has stopped. The game is by all means over, but the play is still alive. The guy gets tackled. But before he gets tackled, he tosses the ball to a second teammate. The second teammate catches the ball, and the, you hear the announcer, oh, the ball is still in play. And, you know, his voice is beginning to elevate. And, and, and the second guy is running, and he gets tackled. But before he hits the ground, he tosses the ball to a third guy. He keeps running. He, now the band is on. The band of the opposing team is now on the field. They're celebrating because they think the game is over. The third guy gets the ball. He continues running. He gets tackled, passes it to a fourth guy. The fourth guy is running. He gets tackled, passes it to a fifth guy. The fifth guy, mm -hmm. the fifth guy doesn't even look. He just tosses the ball up. A sixth guy catches the ball, runs into the band and into the end zone. Six players, y'all. Six players, y'all. Praise God for the Baptist movement and the way they advance the ball. Praise God for the Methodist movement and the way they advance the ball. Praise God for the Presbyterians and the way they advance. Praise God for the Methodists and the way. But now, 
now. God desires us to take the ball into the end zone. And I want y'all to understand, beloved, that just as those, stand, those people in the stands were on their feet, like what? Angels are not like, yo! <sighs> They're waiting for us to realize that the ball is in our court, that it's our time. You are not a Seventh-day Adventist, beloved, by accident, by mistake. God has called you for such a time as this. Interestingly enough, as God is bringing the movement that is supposed to restore the true account of creation and the Sabbath, at the same time, there's a man by the name of Charles Darwin who has just released two essays that will be the foundation of, of evolution in 1842 and in 1844. Coincidence? I don't think so. Beloved, it is at this time in 1844 that the three angels' messages begin to go forth into the world. The first angel's message, I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth, to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people, saying with a loud voice, fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment is come. What is, his, what is he judging? God is right now selecting jurors. I don't know if y'all caught that. <laughs> That's what he's judging. He's trying to see who are going to be my jurors that I'm going to take with me into the supreme court of heaven. They need to be law-abiding citizens, knowing the difference between right and wrong, and not be swayed by the music. Not be swayed by the TV. Not be swayed by the things of this world, not be swayed by the devil's attractions for them. I'm looking for jurors. I'm looking for jurors who are going to be able to withstand public opinion. All right. I'm going to see if I can f do this as quickly as I can. The Bible says in Matthew 24, and this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for witness, and then shall the end come. Well, if the gospel has been being preached since the days of Jesus, how is this verse not fulfilled yet? It's because during the dark ages, this gospel was tainted. And it was not until 1844 that this gospel was restored. And so now it is this gospel that when it goes into all the world, guess what? The end comes. Do y'all understand your mission? Your mission is to take this movie that we just saw into the world. That's your mission. I need you to check this out. Follow this. this we're, we're on our closing scenes here. Uh, the final message of God's people, the final message is to get into the ark. Get, just like Noah, get into the ark. Get into the, get into the ark of the covenant. Get into the ark. Why? Because there is the place of safety. He that abideth under the shadow of the almighty. He that dwelleth in the secret place. Come on, y'all. The secret place of the Most High. Now I need you to follow this, okay? The Bible says that, that at the end of time, right, at the, to, to oppose this message, ultimately Satan's going to set up a, a mark that no man might buy or sell, save he that had the mark or worship the beast, etc. I need you to see this. There are four things here that we're warned against. The worship of the beast, his image, his number, and his mark. I need you to understand that these four things that we are to avoid are literally counterfeits of the first four commandments. The worship of the beast is in direct opposition to worship God only first commandment. The image of the beast is in direct opposition to thou shalt not worship graven images. The number of, the, of his name is in direct contrast to taking the name of the Lord in vain. So whatever the mark is, it is a direct counterfeit of the fourth commandment. Check this out. 
when Moses and Aaron and Nadab and Abihu and 70 of the elders, they saw the God of Israel, that there was under his feet as it were a paved work of a sapphire stone, and it were as the body of heaven in his clearness. And the Lord said unto Moses, come up to me in the mount and be there, and I will give thee tables of stone and a law and commandments that thou may teach them. When Moses went up there to receive the commandments, he says, I noticed under the feet of God that there was sapphire stone. Sapphire is blue. Blue. So there was blue stone underneath God's feet. And then the Bible says that God took that stone and wrote the law. Meaning that the Ten Commandments was written on blue stone. Meaning that the Ten Commandments is literally God's blue print. In other words, God has a blue law. God has a blue law. Amen? And if God has a blue law, and we know that Satan is trying to counterfeit that, then Satan himself is also going to have a... I don't even know what the, number, what, the, what the color blue represents. Obedience. Obedience. When the children of Israel, when the guy had broken the Sabbath, and then, you know, he, he died for breaking the Sabbath, and then God says, I need you all to put ribbons of blue on your garment so that you will remember my commandments. So the, the, the color blue means remembering God's commandments, and Satan is going to say, we're going to do something that's going to cause them to forget God's commandments. That's his blue law. And so, um, let's go to this last scene. Yeah, yeah, last scene. So, the millennium. Jesus comes, everybody say praise the Lord. Jesus comes, he, he gathers the jury. By the way, only jurors are going to heaven. Don't skip jury duty, y'all. Only jurors are going to heaven. They're going to sit, the Bible says, the Bible says, uh, uh, and I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the key of the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand, and he laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil and Satan, and bound him a thousand years, and cast him into the what? Bottomless pit, and shut him up and set a seal upon him, that he should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years should be fulfilled, and after that he must be loose a little season. And I saw thrones, and they sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God, and which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands. And they lived and reigned with Christ. How long? A thousand years, but the rest of the dead lived not again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. And now I need you all to catch this. Because, when, listen, in heaven, was there a sabbatismos? Was it followed by the breaking of the sabbatismos? Was there a time of mercy? A 70 times 7? Was there a time of war? Was there a time of cleansing? Was Lucifer cast out into a desolate earth to be judged by newly created humanity? And what happened was Lucifer was like, I'm going to stop this plan. And God said... Well, you could try, but guess what? Was there a sabbatismos in the Garden of Eden? Did sin break that sabbatismos? Was there a time of mercy extended to the people of God for 70 weeks? Was there a time of war, a time of change of 1260 years? Was there a time of cleansing, 2300 years? At the end of that time, is Satan going to be cast out to a redesolated earth to be judged by newly recreated humanity? God said, we're just going to do it again. <laughs> you will be judged, Lucifer. What he tried to stop in the Garden of Eden comes to pass after all. And then, when a thousand years are expired, the, by, the, the wicked dead will be raised. And I need you all to listen carefully now. Our planet will turn into the largest movie theater the universe has ever seen. Because everybody is going to be there to watch this final movie. It is the movie that you and I just saw. 
in panoramic view, the wicked and the righteous will see the part they played in earth's final movie. Now, I don't know about you, but when I think about the idea of having my life flash before the entire... <laughs> and so I praise God that he edits. <laughs> he edits. He blots out with the blood of Jesus. Okay, we'll edit that. <laughs> delete. <laughs> How many of you would like a lot of delete portions in your <laughs> Delete. De it's the blood that deletes. Praise God. But, beloved, I need you to understand that the wicked, as you're standing there watching this movie, I don't want anybody looking at me saying, you saw this movie and didn't tell me about it? You knew this and didn't say anything? And then comes that final moment. Then comes that final moment where God is about to destroy the wicked. And, and I need you all to catch this. By the way, it is at this time that every knee bows and every tongue confesses that Jesus Christ is Lord. And then Jesus is about to do what the Bible calls the strange act. Can I get five minutes? Where are we? Where are we? Five, five minutes? <clears throat> Here is a question. Why does God destroy the wicked with fire? Now, I need y'all to listen to me. Did you know that heaven is a city of fire? Meaning, Hebrews 12, 29 tells us our God is a consuming fire. The Bible says there's a sea of glass mingled with fire upon which the righteous stand. How many of you would like to stand on that sea of glass mingled with fire? Are you sure you want to stand? On that sea of glass mingled with fire. If you want to stand on that sea of glass mingled with fire, then you had better be fireproof. Are you with me? The Bible says the angels are ministering spirits of fire. So in other words, heaven is a place of fire. God's throne is a throne of fire. And Jesus says, whoever overcomes, uh, he will sit in my throne as I sit in my father's throne. So it's a place of fire. Now, why is heaven a place of fire? Well, here is why. Because in heaven, fire is the symbol for love. Song of Solomon, chapter 8, verse 7. Many waters cannot quench, what? Love, neither can the floods drown it. Love or fire in the Bible, in heaven, is the symbol of God's love. So now watch this, y'all. When God created Adam and Eve, they could stand in his presence without being consumed. But when they sinned, they then became afraid of the fire because they could no longer stand in God's presence. So God's idea was, man, I want to get man back to the place where he could stand in the fire and not be consumed. Y'all remember Moses and the burning bush? How he sees this bush burning and the bush is on fire. But he's like, why is it that this bush is not being consumed? And God's ideal was Moses. I'm trying to show you and mankind that my ideal for you is for you to be able to stand in my presence and not be afraid. So the devil flips the teaching and says... It's the wicked that stand in fire forever. No, beloved, it is not the wicked that burn forever. It is the righteous that burn forever. Yeah, yeah, no. <laughs> Y'all like, wait, you got that wrong, Pastor. You meant the other way. No, 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 no. Let me show you. Let me show you. The sinners in Zion are afraid. Fearfulness has surprised the hypocrites. Who among us shall dwell with the devouring fire? Who among us shall dwell with everlasting burnings? He that walketh wickedly. Wait a minute. You mean it's the righteous that burn forever? Yes, y'all. It's the righteous that the wicked are not fireproof and therefore they cannot burn forever. They burn up. <laughs> Do 
Why? Because they cannot stand in the presence of a holy God. So watch this. When God is standing there at the end of, at the, end of the 1,000 years and the righteous are in the city and they're standing in the midst of everlasting burnings and they just look happy. Remember Daniel? Remember Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? <laughs> Y'all remember them, right? Remember how they were cast into the fire, but they, they had no hurt. They were just like, oh, you know, we're just here chilling in the fire, you know. Yeah. Why? Because the form of the fourth was in there with them and the fire. But what happened to the wicked that threw them in? They got burnt up. So watch this, y'all. When, when, when God is now about to tell the wicked why they cannot enter heaven, he's got to let them know because if I let you into heaven, it would be eternal hell for you. You would not be able to be happy in the presence of this fiery love. And so God is going to have to demonstrate to them. He's going to have to show them why I can't let you into heaven. And so the way I like to put it is like this. God, with his great big arms of fire, is going to reach out and embrace the wicked one last time. And in that embrace, the wicked will feel what it would be like to live in the presence of God in a sinful state. And they will cry out. They will cry out. They will plead to be put out of misery. And after they have paid for all of their sins, then God will turn them to ashes. See, I need you to understand something. In the days of Noah, there were one set of creatures that did not die in the flood. Did you know that? You want to know who those creatures were? They were the water creatures. <laughs> the water creatures were like, no water. <sighs> they were already water creatures in the very same way, y'all. There is one set of creatures that will survive the second cupping, coming, and that is fire creatures. This is why God desires us to be baptized not only with water, but also in fire. That is why God is trying to set the heart on fire. So my son, when he was little, he used to love dressing like me. And anytime we had anything on a like, he'd be like, Dad, look, we're wearing the same thing. And it was like he's going to lose his mind. Listen to me. When Jesus comes, <laughs> watch this, watch this, watch this. Did you know, did you know that in the sanctuary, God's desire, watch this, y'all. The article, the altar of sacrifice was also called the, 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 the altar of burnt offerings. Fire was on that article. The labor, God says, I want to baptize you with fire. The table of showbread was not his word like a fire in my bones. The altar of incense, you needed fire for the incense to rise. The seven branch candlestick, fire. The law of God written with his fiery finger. I need you to understand that it is through the sanctuary God is trying to grant us six degree burns. <laughs> God is trying to set us on fire so that when he comes again, we'll be like, oh. we will be like him. So God is trying to set us on fire, beloved, and then when, the, when he comes again and the wicked are destroyed, God extends his arms around the wicked, and in that embrace, they feel what it would be like to be in heaven. They will be turned to ashes and to smoke, shall they consume away, and then Satan himself will become ashes. Amen. Amen. 
And then the Bible says, and I saw a new heaven and a new earth for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away and there was no more sea. Nahum 9 says that affliction shall not rise up again the second time. And then watch this, y'all, in Isaiah 66, 22 and 23. For as the new heavens and the new earth which I shall remain, make remain before me, saith the Lord, so shall your seed and your name remain. And it shall come to pass that from one new moon to another and from one Sabbath to another shall all flesh come before me to worship. Heaven will again be God's Sabbatismos. And we will live. Whew. What a movie. Happily ever after. There is your movie. You have just watched. You have just watched. You have just watched a movie that everyone is going to see at some point. It is better to see it now. It is better to share it now. And so I want to make a simple appeal. I'm going to ask you to stand if you're ready for this appeal. My simple appeal is, Lord, I want to be a star in this movie. I want to be a star in this movie. Use me, Lord. Equip me. Teach me. Teach me how to have that fire. Teach me how to have this knowledge. Let me go over this in my mind again and again and again and again. And help me to be a witness, to be a light. Lord, use me as if there were not another person on this planet that had this knowledge and had this truth. Heavenly Father, thank you for speaking to us. Thank you, Lord, for showing us this movie. Thank you, Lord, for changing the lives that you have changed today. Lord, may today be the pivotal point as we are standing in heaven and as we look back at this day, may many here today say it was this point. It was this part of the movie that moved me to be here today. Lord, forgive us of our sins. Cleanse us of our unrighteousness. Cleanse us of our failings and our shortcomings, Lord. And please use us despite ourselves is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. You may be seated. Have you been blessed today? Well, I have a few announcements. Specifically, I'm going to talk about lunch and how that's going to be, and then if you want to talk about the outreach portion and that. So I know that several of you uh, from outside of BMA and those who have registered have brought your own meals. Uh, we are, you can basically eat anywhere on campus except for uh, the library. Uh, so uh, if you have brought your own meals, uh, feel free to uh, take your sack lunch. There's a gazebo outside over to my left, also to my front. And uh, we're going to be meeting back here. I will just say that. We're going to meet back here at 2.15. We're going to try that. Also, for those who have registered and your BMA students, uh, we're going to be asking if you, when you go to the cafeteria, that you will go on the left side of the cafeteria. My left cafeteria is right, but over there towards where the guy's entrance is. We're going to have you go through that door. If you are not going to be participating in the outreach at 2.15, we are going to ask that you just go and you sit down at in the tables. For those who are going to be doing outreach at 2.15, we're going to ask that you will get into line first. Now, what will happen is for those who are in line, those who are doing the outreach, once that line dies down, then those who are not going to be doing outreach will be able to get into that line and partake of the food as well. This way, we are prioritizing the individuals that are going to be going on outreach first. Because as you see the time, we want to make sure that we can get back here at 2.15. So, Mr. Jonathan, share with us a little bit about the next thing after that. 
Yeah, and I want to say one more thing about the cat. Uh, for those who registered online, we do not have everybody's individual name. So if you registered more than one person, we have the person who registered and their group, their party of four. So if you have that party of four with you, you need to go together. So when you walk through that door, they can check you off the list and all the people that came with you. There's a group of 15 here, so try to make sure you stay together. Um, and then the outreach, yes, um, we're going to be back here at, try to be back here at 2.15 so we can get an hour or two out in our community so we can just share what we just heard today with other people. Um, that's about it. And then for those who are not going to be a part of the outreach, we are going to be having our Vespers service at 4 o'clock here. You have an announcement? Oh, excellent. Yeah, so be back here at 4 o'clock. That's going to be from 4 to 5. And then I believe at 5, 5.15, that's when we're going to be having our supper for those who have purchased those already. Pastor Iber. Yeah, I just wanted to share. I know that um, we were talking about some questions, and I said I was going to make my uh, social media um, uh, information available to you. So if any of you have questions for me, uh, you could just follow me on Instagram at Ivor Myers. All right, I-V-O-R-M-Y-E-R-S. And I know there was a lot of questions that were asked and put into the box yesterday. Uh, so be here at 4 o'clock where Pastor Ivor is going to be answering some of those. The Lord bless you. We'll see you back here at 2.15. Adios. <laughs>